welcome to the Feminist Art Field School for those of you who don't frequently join us every Thursday. It's my pleasure to introduce Marina from the Art Gallery of Greater Victoria, who is going to start us off for this session. Awesome, thanks Chase. Uh, and we don't have anyone in the other room right now, so I'm keeping an eye out, but I'm hoping everyone's here who's going to be joining us. Uh, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for uh, joining us today for the final lecture of the Feminist Art Field School series. Uh, as Chase mentioned, my name is Marina DeMaio and I'm part of the staff here at the Art Gallery of Greater Victoria. Uh, I'm the Digital Assets Coordinator at the Gallery, so I feel very lucky to have been the person assisting with this virtual collaboration from behind the scenes. Uh, I was telling one of my colleagues yesterday that I feel kind of like a secret student or something. Um, I've been watching all of the lectures. I think I've seen them all at least twice now. So. I can truly say not only for the gallery, but uh, for myself, just how uh, inspiring these conversations have been and how grateful I am to each and every one of the artists for sharing their ideas, uh, their research and their practices just so, so generously. Um, I think it takes a lot of courage to think out loud in this way and to not shy away from creative institutional critique. So yeah, I just wanted to begin by saying a huge thank you on behalf of the AGGB to all of the artists uh, and to the guest speakers and of course to Chase and Michelle uh, who collectively dreamed up, contributed to, shaped uh, this program into the incredible resource and now uh, video archive that it has become. And uh, as many of you know, the Field School is a collaboration with the University of Victoria. Uh, so we're very lucky to be joining the students from Gender Studies 349 uh, live today in their online course. Uh, the rest of the public facing lectures have been pre-recorded, so you can check those out anytime on our YouTube channel if you haven't already, uh, and you can also access them through the Feminist Art Field School project page on our website. Uh, I'll put those links in the chat for you later on. Now, uh, this particular event is being recorded, so it will also be available on the gallery's website and uh, the gallery's YouTube channel afterwards. So if you have any friends that might have missed it, uh, or if you're like me and you might wanna watch it again, you can definitely keep an eye out for the recording. Um, before I turn it over to Michelle to talk more about this cross-institutional collaboration, I do want to just take a moment to acknowledge that I am coming to you from, and the Art Gallery of Greater Victoria is located on the unceded traditional territories of the Lekwungen speaking peoples, today known as the Esquimalt and Songhees nations. Um, even though we're gathering virtually at this time, for those of you who have been following along with the field school, you, you already know the importance of considering the land first, even as we're all coming together from different places in virtual spaces. So I just wanted to take this moment to extend my deep appreciation for the opportunities that I've had to live and work and make art on these beautiful lands of the Lekwungen peoples and just say that on behalf of the gallery, how grateful we are for learning opportunities like the field school that really continue to expand uh, and challenge our understanding of what it means to be on these lands with reciprocity and with respect for those whose families have been its stewards from time immemorial. Um, to, to kind of paraphrase something that Tanya Willard said in her lecture, I think it was along the lines, the lands are beaming into this Zoom format. So I just thought I'd highlight that because it's something that really is resonating with me. Um, yeah, so thank you everyone for being here today and for thinking through these important topics with us. Uh, and for beginning this special capstone lecture for the field school in this way. Uh, please feel free to reach out to me through the chat function at any point during the discussion this morning uh, or the rest of the leadership team here, particularly if you have any technical questions or issues. 
Um, you're welcome to turn your cameras on or off at any point in time, uh, but I think we're asking that folks leave their mics off until the Q&A at the end. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it over to you, Michelle. Thanks, Marina. Um, Marina, um, you and Nicole and Julia have been such an important uh, behind the, the scenes part of the Feminist Art Field School. And I really want to thank you all, but I'm particularly glad that you're the person representing the AGGV this morning because the work that you did transforming um, what were pretty basic Zoom recordings into really beautiful um, videos for us all to watch every week was um, very, very uh, creative and inspiring and I think was a very important um, part of why this course has been so enjoyable for all of us. So thank you so much. Um, our vision for the Feminist Art Field School um, began while I was the chief curator at the Art Gallery of Greater Victoria. Um, but now I'm the head of exhibitions and collections and chief curator at Ramey Modern, which is located in Treaty 6 territory in the homeland of the Métis, um, in a city that many of you may know as Saskatoon. Um, I thank both the AGGV and Ramey Modern for um, their commitment to the potential of cross-institutional collaboration. And um, they are both institutions that think very deeply and carefully about where they are located, what their relationships are to the Indigenous communities that have lived in their spaces, in those spaces, um, as Marina said, since time immemorial. And um, in thinking through that and in thinking how to, about how to be better institutions, um, it becomes clear that that um, museums have to work differently, not just be spaces of entertainment or delivery of product, um, but they need to be institutions that participate in this kind of um, profound uh, critique of institutions, um, histories and presence. And um, we have to think through how to be better in the future. Um, most museums collaborate in some way with their local universities, recognizing um, a community of shared interest in the students and faculty, but it has been rare, in my experience at least, to engage in a partnership like this one, which has been sustained and rich and full of potential for um, a very long time. Um, I'd like to also thank the AGGV and the University of Victoria for their very practical uh, financial support that made the field school a reality over these past uh, two years of development and delivery. And um, that support also enabled um, Megan Ingram and Abby Maxwell to join the leadership team and the team uh, was so much better for their presence and participation. So over the past 10 weeks, we've had conversations with and alongside artists, curators, writers, and thinkers who have offered us entry into the ways in which they think deeply and critically about these troubling times in which we coexist. A deep questioning of institutions that surround art and artists has been a constant thread in all of our conversations. Emerging from our weeks of analysis and critique, I feel surprisingly buoyed by what I have learned, having the opportunity to think about what needs to change in institutions and why uh, this change needs to happen with such a multitude of insightful and engaged voices, the leadership team and students alike um, has made me more hopeful that I can engage in my work at the museum from a place of true potential and possibility. I would, of course, be remiss if I didn't take this opportunity to uh, thank Chase uh, in um, the presence of not only the students of the Feminist Art Field School, but also the members of the public who have joined us. Um, 
for setting up the beautiful collaborative structure of the Feminist Art Field School and from week to week uh, leading us with intelligence and um, joy that I have rarely seen in a classroom. Um, and of course, Chase, an extra heartfelt thanks for bringing Julieta Singh and her wonderful book, The Breaks, into the realm of our thinking and exploration. So now I will pass things over to Chase to introduce Julia and the program for the morning. Oh, what a pleasure it is to be here. And thank you for so many kind words. And I see our friends from Community Engaged Learning uh, just joined the Zoom in time for my extended thanks. So in addition to everything that has already been offered by our team, I want to add um, special acknowledgement to my colleagues at the gender studies department at UVic and to our friends in the dean's office who really advocated for and made this possible. It's all well and good to come to your colleagues and say, I have this idea for this multi-institutional collaboration that will happen on Zoom with a public facing component and all kinds of interlocutors and friends and to have them say, great idea, but how do you, how do you, how do you plan to make that happen? And instead, we were met with such enthusiasm and such willingness to make this work. And we are deeply, deeply grateful for the, the help and support of an experiential learning fund grant, one of many forms uh, and ways that UVic has contributed to making this possible. They call the, experiment, uh, the experiential learning fund grant an ELF, and I always think it should be experimental learning fund. If anyone wants to take that idea and run with it, you definitely should. For those of you who do not join us every Thursday, I wanted to take a few moments to give you a little bit broader of a sense of what the school, field school has felt like. We engage asynchronous lectures that have been pre-recorded with artists, and then we meet every week to discuss, and we're guided by readings and media objects, and we are committed to moving as a collective and moving through the most important questions that arise for us on the day based on the material. And that means it has been a winding and glorious journey across a variety of different institutional contexts. And I echo Michelle when I say there couldn't be a better place to land than with Julieta Singh and her new book, The Breaks. Julieta is an associate professor of English and Gender Studies at the University of Richmond, where she works across post-colonial studies and queer theory. She's the author of three books, and in my job as host, I have brought them all so that you can look at them here as I introduce them. Unthinking Mastery, which was published by Duke University Press, No Archive Will Restore You, which came out from Punctum, and of course, most recently, The Breaks, which is out in Canada, the US and the UK simultaneously. And it is my pleasure to tell you here that it was also just named by the New York Public Library as one of the books of the year and honored by the seminary co-op on a similar list. And we're so, so lucky to be in your presence today. So thank you for making the time. For the remainder of our hour, which is going to fly by, I can only imagine, uh, we will start with some comments and a reading by Julieta and then our hope is to open up the floor for ongoing conversation and collaboration. Julieta, thank you for being here. Thanks so much. Thanks for the beautiful introduction, Chase. I also um, want to begin with a whole bunch of thanks. Um, some, some thanks toward people I'm only just meeting today. I'm really thankful to Chase and Michelle for organizing all of this and all the extraordinary uh, feminists who have helped to make this happen, including uh, Marina, Nicole, Julia, Megan, and Abby, whom I've met in, in UVic classes last year. Um, and I'm just so happy to be here with all of you. Um, I am zooming in from occupied Powhatan lands um, in Richmond, Virginia, where I work. Um, but I'm from Treaty uh, One territory in, in Winnipeg. So thanks for having me. Thanks for, for letting me land with you here in this final um, day of incredible presentations across the semester. And I just had an idea as I was in the waiting room um, that, that I would do, I was going to come in and do a reading and then open the floor for conversation. 
but I thought what I would do is move backwards through the key terms of feminist field school and talk for a few minutes about school and talk for a few minutes about field and talk for a few minutes about feminist, um, punctuating those terms by readings from um, my new book. So um, I wanted to make one comment, which is that I don't have a brain that's capable of um, reading and communicating with you all and reading the chat at the same time. <laughs> So I love the chat and I always ask people to screen grab the chat for me so that I can read it later, but I can't think and, and, and be in the chat world at the same time. So if you have things to say and you want to put them in the chat, maybe somebody else who's helping to facilitate can, can shout that out to me. Okay, so um, I think many of you who are here have read the breaks already, so I don't need to do a big introduction to what the book is, but um, you likely know already that it takes the form of a long letter to my daughter about race, inheritance, and mothering at the end of the world. And um, when I was invited by Chase and Michelle to join the Feminist Field School, I think I was still drafting the book. I think I hadn't even sold the book yet, or was just getting getting close to, to finding a publishing home and very much worried that I wouldn't find a publishing home. So it's really <laughs> nice to be in this other place now and have it actually exist in the world and in multiple forms. Um, and um, I think that the impetus for writing the book really began with my child's entry into the public education system in the United States and the realization, which kind of begins on the first page of that book of um, having to grapple as a mom with the fact that my child was going to be learning a, a state sanctioned and top town education that really was fundamentally in opposition to my own understanding of history and the narratives that that I tell about the past and the present. So I wanted to begin with education, with school, um, by reading just a short passage, and then I'll, I'll move along. From the, the onset of your public education, you have been learning what it means to be American through a manicured version of history that keeps European whiteness at its center. This form of education willfully forgets the lives that were destroyed, the bodies that were brutalized, and the cultures and traditions that were abolished or displaced to establish that center space. It tells you a singular and continuous narrative of Western capitalist expansion, obscuring the bleak fact that much of what we call progress has been a direct and unrelenting line to the wholesale destruction of the earth. Against this obliterating narrative, I glean from the fragments in an attempt to teach us otherwise. I scramble to harvest alternative histories omitted by the textbooks, the histories of those who have faced annihilation and lived toward survival. Learning to mother at the end of the world is an infinite toggle between wanting to make you feel safe and needing you to know that the earth and its inhabitants are facing a catastrophic crisis. This morning, you went off to school to learn discipline, to hone your reading and writing skills, to study official state history. I am at my desk sipping tea, turning over words. The birds are chirping outside my window. You, me, the birds. We are all creatures living as though we have a future, as though tomorrow will continue to resemble today. Meanwhile, Plans are being devised to drive the marketplace forward when the Earth's non-renewable resources are exhausted. Scientists and businessmen are plotting to colonize the moon in a relentless drive to create an alternative human habitat when this one can no longer foster us. There is no consideration of ceasing extraction, only a maniacal mission to discover other worlds to plunder. When the Earth is rendered uninhabitable, when extractive capitalism leads to wholesale ecological collapse, we will not be chosen for this other planetary world. We, along with nearly everyone else, will be left in ecological destruction to scavenge what we can from the wreckage or to perish. The truth is, I am glad not to be among the chosen ones. I know in my body the cost of discovering new worlds, the brutal violence that accompanies the colonial mission. No. I do not want to leave this planet. What I want is another world. And when I say another world, I mean this one, toppled and reborn.
I'm going to skip ahead a couple of pages and, and talk for a minute about field. And I almost was going to perform a spoiler and read an actual scene in a field <laughs> that ends this, this book of mine. Um, but instead of, instead of the, the spoiler, in case anybody hasn't read through all the way yet or had a chance to read the book yet, um, I wanted to think about field in part through discipline and through academic training and the ways in which we're we're taught narrowly through very particular kinds of fields and very particular kinds of disciplines and how much this book and, and parenting and my other books too have been acts of unlearning much of that discipline or to learn, to learn what to do with my fields otherwise. Um, and we can talk a little bit about, about being an academic and, and thinking about form and, and audience and how to write in that capacity too, I think. But I wanna read a very quick scene with my daughter in, in a kind of expansion of the field of, of horizon or her, her ability to teach me how to think more broadly um, and against the grain. On the sixth day of a nine day work trip, the longest period I have been away from you, I FaceTime home and find you deeply engaged in an act of fruit sculpting. You tell me you are making a Powhatan village. The Powhatan people are represented by banana slices and apple skins make up their shelters. Off to the side of the village, you have crafted colonial ships by slicing kiwis in half, gutting their insides and attaching the skins to the little fruit boats to serve as sails. You have created rough waters out of banana peels and a wall of carved apple manatees that surround the kiwi ships on all sides. What's happening in this scene, I ask. The rough waters and manatees are pushing the Europeans back home, you reply earnestly. I'm blown away to witness this art making against the state, this anti-colonial fruit installation that is also a fantasy of organically reversing history. What I love most is that in your historical revisioning, you move us beyond the subjugated histories of indigenous resistance to colonial force. Instead, you turn your attention to the sea, letting it emerge as an actor in the opposition to the colonial mission. Your artwork veers me away from the anthropocentric position, carefully and imaginatively invoking what the earth itself might desire. And finally, um, I'm gonna read um, a, a bit about um, queer family making and my relationship with my daughter's um, father, uh, my co-parent who's also my best friend, um, and to read a little bit about um, anti-normative relations and, and queer family making. We coined the term friends in love to describe our relation while smoking pot and sipping juice at my old Formica table. I had just returned from a trip to the Bay Area where a would-be fling in Wyden country had gone woefully awry. Having nowhere else to go, I crashed in Berkeley with friends, a queer couple with a penchant for a rescue. We spent the evening before I flew home, evaluating my flailing romantic life. My friends invited me to write a list of five characteristics I could not do without in a future partner, which I scrawled on a piece of scrap paper that remains to this day in the drawer of my bedside table. I was embarrassed by performing this task, which seemed both a practical undertaking aimed at offering me personal clarity and a witchy conjuring to manifest my ideal person. The next day, fresh off my flight as I lumbered down Franklin Avenue on the number two bus, I passed Nathan's street and felt an overwhelming sense of arrival. I considered the feeling for days, wondering over a bonded connection that was neither conventionally romantic nor simply amicable. A week later at the Formica table, giddy and stoned, I gathered the courage to present Nathan with my friends in love formulation. He smiled elatedly, accepting wholeheartedly what was, in retrospect, a queer proposal. We were intimate accomplices, misfits bunking collectively in my minuscule apartment. We studied together, learning in constant communion. Nathan seemed to live on my old orange sofa, flat on his back with a novel or book of philosophy in hand, while my once feral cat Cassie slept on his belly. He wouldn't move for anything if she was content, even though she made a practice of attacking him in unanticipated intervals 
to ensure he knew his place among us, a newcomer, a man. He was and remains the gentlest person I have ever known, and the first relationship of any kind in my life, whether filial, friendly, or romantic, that grew through a total lack of judgment or possessive feeling. Nothing about me deterred him or made him bristle. He approached me as he did his most coveted works of literature, with meticulous care and textual precision, with repetition, reading me over and over again with a lasting patience, interpreting my gaps and fissures, not as failures, but as opportunities for sense-making. It is harder from this vantage point to say what he has gained through our queer solidarity, but I know he finds in me an unflappable kinship we never knew we could desire for ourselves. Amid our leap into late onset adulthood, we felt the hailing of normativity, the strong sense that we should make our relationship legible for the world. We merged into a couple form, following a straight path because we didn't yet have the drive to blaze another trail. When I finished my PhD and got an assistant professor job in Virginia, we packed up our graduate student lives and headed southeast in a beat up old Honda Civic. We lived out our heterosexual union, happily nesting for the long haul, living, living a deeply affectionate, though largely non-sexual life. More often than not, we treated sexuality with humor. Nathan teased me about my unabashed attraction to butches, a fact I had always thought was an imperceptible desire. In turn, I joked that in our awkward sex, Nathan seemed to be keeping full throttle anxiety attacks at bay, suffering his way through an act he would much prefer to avoid. I referred to Nathan as monastic, which I still think best describes his style of being. This was many years before asexual found its way into a public vocabulary, so we had little language for someone who simply preferred not to engage in sexual contact with others. His library and his collection of records have always been his love objects of choice, so much so that he has written evocative, evocatively about the sensuality of those particular relations. I was still at a remove from using queer to describe myself, not because I had any hesitation about queer sexualities, but because I was uneasy about laying claim to pre-existing identity categories. In the couple form, we would lapse from time to time into a pathological approach to our sex life, feeding a mutual worry that our scant and uneasy sexual contact constituted a lack between us. At a crit critical juncture of our relationship, we descended into a corrective frenzy and sought medical advice for Nathan's muted sex drive. He underwent testing that concluded he had abnormally low levels of testosterone and was prescribed injections to restore him into the proper form, fold of normative masculinity. Nathan was unfaltering in response to the medical prescription, unequivocally declare, declaring, I am who I am and I hold the politics I hold precisely because I fall beyond the capture of normativity. He refused to be delivered into corrective masculinity or to aspire anymore to an other oriented sexual drive. It was such a simple act to commit without pause to accepting himself exactly as he was. I felt astonished by the gesture, so mundane as to be spectacular. Rather than break from each other at this crucial point, we broke instead from traditional ideas about what constitutes love and family. I followed Nathan's commitment to simple gestures, allowing us to live our lives exactly as they were, and in so doing to change the entire feel of it. Disengaging from a sexual fantasy of lasting love, we offered each other instead an enduring home, the safest place to falter and thrive, a place as psychic as it is spatial in which to break and heal, to come apart when we must, then to mend into new alignments. We became what we already were, friends who make family together, who raise a wild little human and offer sanctuary to stray animals, who collaborate intellectually, who make meals together and bandage each other's wounds. Friends who, in breaking from convention, have become unbreakable. Okay, I'll end there and, and um, say to you all that I welcome you to ask me any questions at all. Nothing's, nothing's off the table. 
I'm not a shy person. I'm happy to engage you wherever you are and in whatever you want to talk about. Uh, Julieta, thank you so much. It was so beautiful. And it's always such a pleasure to get to encounter your words through your lips. I feel like there's such a difference in the registers and the ways in which we can understand the work that you're doing. And I would love to start our conversation by um, passing to Megan and Abby, member of our leadership team, um, who I know have arrived to the Zoom with some questions. And to the rest of us in the room, please do turn on your camera if you feel so inspired. If not, um, Abby, as always, is very happy to manage the chat and will offer up your questions to the room, no problem or hesitation. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for that beautiful reading, Julieta. Um, I was wondering, in reading the breaks, you mentioned the experience of making and remaking language in collaboration with your daughter. Um, and I was wondering if you could speak to if or how this sort of remaking of language influenced your writing process. Yeah, that's a great question. Well, um, I was just thinking about the miseducation of Lauren Hill as my <laughs> as my soundtrack and, and thinking a lot about how um when you when you are really conscious of learning something you're almost always conscious of learning something through learning new words and new terms through which to operate and one of the really cool things about parenting is you have to kind of return to language in a really simplistic way to start explaining um a child's access to the world and opening up of a child's horizon into what things are and how they work and what they mean and and you know I'm a writer and a, and a and a language scholar, so it's not it's it's kind of obvious coming from me. But to realize so much through in part through Mel Chen's work on animacy that that the language that we're operating in, the language that we speak, my my um, my first language, English, is a, a language that that hierarchizes and and and. Um, puts into binary categories all kinds of things that don't belong there. And so learning to talk and learning to educate and learning to articulate is often a trap of finding yourself in language that separates you from the world or puts you in a kind of antagonism or opposition to a world um, where you have to use that opposition to also undo it. And so I think that that moment was also um, you know, very, very much inspired by learning the distinction between um, humans and animals, animate and inanimate things, girls and boys, men and women, and having to introduce her to the concepts at the same time as I was trying to break them down. I don't know if that totally answers your question, Megan, but to start. It absolutely did. Thank you so much. Thanks. Um, maybe this will like carry it along in a similar direction but um yeah so throughout the feminist art field school thus far we've we've been encountering again and again the use of like correspondence as a method and form um and so just felt the like richness in the sort of vulnerability and like experimentalism that seems to get carried um through this commitment um and of course, your work is a letter to your daughter. So it sort of reads as this like display of intimacy and pedagogy that's been like made public. Um, so I'm just wondering if you could speak a little bit about the process of writing this letter and where it's taken you and like what using correspondence as your form is like doing now that the book has been made public. That's a really great question, Abby. Thanks for asking it. Um, I think the letter form for me um, started very organically. And I, I started writing it as actually a letter to my daughter that was not meant for publication. And as I was writing and rewriting and working on it, and it was growing into something that looked like a book, um, I was writing it also thinking that that intimacy and that form of correspondence um, was not something that would be widely accepted by the world that I live in here in the United States where discourses of race are, are very polarized around black and white lines through the history of slavery um, and where there's not a very robust 
discourse um, of brownness here and and the fact of having a, a mixed brown kid and and trying to write into a space that doesn't have a strong um, this this kind of links us back to Megan's question around language and what terms we use but you know the the way in which a term like POC is conflated with blackness in the United States and where indigeneity is is very um, buried in in a kind of public or social or discursive presence and so I think the part of the intimacy of of writing to my daughter in this book was about trying to find my way into um, a discursive space that doesn't really exist here for her and then realizing as I was writing it that I that the you of the book was also becoming a much more expansive and much less singular kind of you. Um, so that's one one answer and the question of of putting a kind of intimate correspondence out into the world is um, you know, I think that I, I think that I, um, I'm a person who writes very intimately and very um, personally about issues that I think are um, life sustaining and absolutely political. And so I think I don't have a lot of, you know, one of the things we talked about in a in a class visit at UVic that I had the the privilege of doing last year was. The, the question of writing vulnerably or writing writing intimately and putting it out there seems from the outside, I think, sometimes like an act of exposing oneself. And I see the urgency of the topics and the, the necessity of, of understanding ourselves through, by and through those politics. Um, in a way that kind of trumps the, that the kind of like displaces the the question of like, are you exposed? And you know, I think every everything we make and everything we do and every act of of putting things into the world is also an act of curation. So it's both both me and not me in some way, um, and also the you is both my child and not my child in some way that we're always more than one and always proliferating and. Um, yeah, I don't know, Abby, do you want to chime in and kind of steer me a little bit if I'm not totally answering your... No, that's that's really great. That's helpful. Thank you. Who else wants to jump in? Sorry. <clears throat> Um, uh, it's not really a question, but just um, as a person who, who sort of falls outside the usual binaries of, of race and stuff as a mixed person, I, I, I really want to thank you for the book. It, um, I'm still making my way through it because I want to read it slowly and digest it, but I, it's, it is just beautiful. Um, I'm going to, to share it with my sister who's, who's raising a child also in the, you know, in, in that sort of mixed space and, and finding her way through. So uh, thank you very much. It's beautiful. Thank you so much. And you're, you're making me feel better about not reading the, the scene in the field at the end. <laughs> so I didn't spoil it for you. <laughs> Thanks so much for saying that. That means a lot to me, Sarah. Thank you. Kyla. Uh, sorry. Um, I was just wondering if um, you had like a thought process into deciding like to not make your books events formatted in chronological order because I don't know I really thought that that was really engaging when it kept like jumping back and forth but I was wondering if there was a thought process to that. That's a great question. I um... I think I, I, I when I when I get really nice compliments about this book, people say it just flows. It reads so effortlessly, and I, <laughs> I cut and paste and moved things around so often that that even I lost track of of where we were in time much of the time. But I think that the you know the the period represented in the book is really a period between my daughter being three and my daughter being eight, and so and it started when she was six. 
So it started when she was six and then I was doing revisions when she was eight and the pandemic hit. So kind of the book brought us into pandemic times and, and in the immediate aftermath of George Floyd's murder. So that, that ended up in the book, but a lot of it was a kind of archive that I had been assembling in my head of moments of possibility that I was witnessing through her. Um, and also moments where I was butting up as a mom, um, who's a, you know, lofty utopian intellectual where I was butting up against the limits of my own politics. And so I was sort of gathering probably mostly unconsciously scenes that were unfolding between us where I was watching what I'm teaching her fall apart in the face of what I'm willing to do and not willing to do. So there's a moment, for instance, where she's trying to advocate in the book for us turning our duplex. Um, I, I share a duplex with, with her dad and he lives downstairs and I live upstairs, but we mostly use it as a single family home where she was trying to convince us to move into one part of the duplex and open up the other part of the duplex for homeless kids and their families. And she had this like flawless, incredible plan for how we could organize the space and how we could arrange things and how the parents could have privacy and she could be babysitting and we could make soup every day and it was the most magical beautiful plan and in the face of it i simply said no <laughs> um or like that's a really great plan but um and i and i think it i think it was so the the temporality like where she was in time was less important to me than those moments where i was really confronted with something that i thought was incredibly generative and where um i was being asked through my encounters with her to rethink the 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 break between what i teach the things the values that i bestow in her and how far i'm willing to to see them through in the in the everyday mundane aspects of our everyday lives unfolding um so yeah moves across about a five-year period but um but but non-chronologically because it's really sort of more topical about events or moments that kind of carry us across and got really shuffled around <laughs> throughout the throughout the final revision process Um, there's a question in the chat that maybe I'll just read, and I'm really glad it's been asked because I was also curious about this, but Eve asks, has your daughter read it? Yes, she's read many, many parts of it, and none of it is a surprise to her because every night when I was writing the book at dinner, we'd sit down and I'd say, today I was writing about the time we were driving around in Los Angeles and you wanted to be the president of the United States of America. So she, none of it's, um, none of the scenes are surprising to her because she, she either remembers them all through um like fa family legacy and and narrating like things that have happened in our past or through dinner time conversations and then i also um recorded the audio book so she also has my voice reading the book to her for for nighttime listening so we we dip in and read passages and move also non chronologically through through it from time to time so she hasn't read it from cover to cover but it's she has a copy on her shelf that's that's inscribed to her and she <laughs> picks it up and does with it as she as she pleases she also really likes these stickers that um coffee house press made that have her uh, protest sign that says um no walls no meanies more girls on it so she's <laughs> she's sporting around her own her own merch <laughs> And I bet you if there's any member of the Feminist Art Field School who would like a few of those stickers for the back of your Mac or your water bottle, we could really make that happen. Oh yeah, I will hook you up for sure. <laughs> I'd be happy to. Michelle. Um, I am thinking back to the, uh, the few days that Chase and I spent um, in conversation with with all of our other guest speakers uh it was a very sort of condensed time and we had a kind of run sheet of questions um and uh well i'll give the question that we asked first but then i'm gonna complicate it a little bit um based on on your reading and and conversation so the the question that came um, at the close of each of the conversations was about um, whether people saw a place for institutions 
um, in the making of better and more just futures for us all. And um, I'm so interested in things that have come up in your commentary, Julieta, about um, uh, the hierarchy of animacy and language. I mean, we weren't speaking particularly about animacy, but we have talked about colonial languages as um, uh, hierarchical, as um, kind of evasive in um, how they uh, refer to the truth. Um, and it's, it's occurring to me, of course, that language is an institution, as we've talked about institutions over the course of the semester, we've been thinking mostly about um, the academy and, and museums. But um, I was already feeling a little bit hopeful about how, how these institutions could be undone and turned into something useful. And now seeing the parallels between um, your, your explorations of language and the way you transform it, um, uh, I'm feeling ever more hopeful. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about um, whether I'm, I'm right to be hopeful or is, is language a particular kind of institution that, that has a different kind of potential or? Okay, that's a, that's a, a doozy of a question, but I, but I also love it. Um, I really love uh, the, the formulation from Fred Moten and Stefano Harney from the Undercommons, where they talk about being in but not of the institution. And I and I and I we can we can translate this we can translate this to language that's a pun that wasn't wasn't intended but works nonetheless. Um, but I but I I see a lot of I don't think institutions in and of themselves or at least the institutions that we're talking about here whether we're talking about English or whether we're talking about the university they're colonial apparatuses and I think there's no way around that. Um, but I believe in in the undoing and reshaping. Um, I think it would be a, a grave danger to ever put our political hope <laughs> in institutions. But I, I, I believe as a as a as a as a working professor and as a working writer that in order to do my work, institutions make that work possible, or institutions make the life that I'm that I'm leading possible. Um, and I think that there's something really challenging and kind of extraordinary about being really with the fact that we are in colonialism and that we are with colonialism and that we are super saturated by it and working by and through experimental practices to 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 change the, the mold of it um and so i i'm i think that there there was a moment in my kind of training or my political orientation where I felt incredibly disturbed um, by, by the fact of colonialism. And the more that I was learning, the more dispirited I kind of became. And then at some point I kind of I, I maneuvered around it and realized that that it's a that wishing it away or or merely being angry at it wasn't producing in me the kind of transformative potential of working or living in in alternate ways like one could be trapped in a bad <laughs> marriage or trapped in a bad job or trapped wherever or one can can find ways to to transform and i think for me um i don't have any special investment in institutions i mostly you know really appreciate my job for for what it offers the quality of my life and the fact that it gives me access to very smart excellent young thinkers um, and some excellent smart old thinkers. Um, but it also um, it, 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 it opens space to do work. And, and I'm fortunate to have that space um, be a space in which my work is uninhibited by it, in which I can produce what I want to produce, even if it's a critique, for instance, of the university. I just published a special issue with Nathan, who's represented in this book, my collaborator, Queer Bestie, um, that is a, a, a fierce kind of colonial 
uh, edited edited volume of a journal called Social Social Text that is really about a critique of the university as such and its colonial origins, and so how to think those of us who are on the margins of of the institution and institutional life, how do we think with it and through it? So I'll send that to you, Michelle, because it might be interesting to think about. But I am never without hope. I believe in hope, and I'll believe in hope until there's no capacity for me to be believe in hope. So I'm glad you're I'm glad you're there with me. I think it's vital, and I think without it, we we succumb to colonialism in some way. I'd love to create some space for those who might want to join the conversation, but need a second or two to unmute. And I know that Julieta, as a professor, is not afraid of silence on Zooms. So take your time. <laughs> That's true. I'm happy to chill here with you and wait you out. My my teacherly self kind of wants to um, as I'm because I'm watching the people with their cameras on and I can see your faces and I'm kind of studying you and it makes me want to call on you. So thank you for taking the <laughs> risk of, <laughs> of, of putting your videos on. Um, that, that's what not, would never just to tell we would never we, we we don't have a call on culture in this yeah. feminist art oh, I see. I But see. I do see I do see Emily's hand and I see May in the chat. So, awesome. Thanks. And I'll also say, like, I'm looking at Siskin and I feel like Siskin's got something to say, but I'm not going <laughs> to call on them. <laughs> Emily, go ahead. Hi, uh, thank you so much for being here. I really enjoyed your book. Um, okay. And uh, you were speaking about transformation, and I'm just wondering if the process of writing this book um, produced any transformation within you. I, I was thinking about this the other day because I I think that every book that I've written paves the way for the next book that I write. Like it's always something in the last book that prompts me into the next one, um, a kind of chain reaction. And I definitely think so. I think that that my um, my orientation right now is really driven toward those moments that I was reflecting on earlier where I realized that my politics are limited and that in some really important way, I don't have the I don't have the knowledge to produce the kind of transformation that I want to produce. And so when I'm reading really incredible um, science studies, like biological studies and understanding the environment that I'm living in better and understanding how to kind of cultivate um, and, and be with the environment better, I find a lot of excitement and generative possibilities. And I think part of what the breaks has taught me is to not shy away from the limits of my politics as they exist now, but to learn how to undo them. And so I'm imagining this kind of like multi-year incredible <laughs> um, odyssey that I want to go on where I want to go to people who have knowledge that I don't yet have and spend time with them and study what they do and understand what they do toward decolonial practices and, and decolonial lives um, to, to learn how to put those politics into action better. I must tell you that the chat is alive. We have many directions we're gonna go, but let's go to Danny first. I see your hand and then Abby, perhaps we can go down to the chat and pull some of those questions out. Hi. Um, Hi. Uh, uh, thank you for doing this reading. It was really beautiful. Um, yeah, I've just kind of been thinking about the potentials of, yeah, like writing intimately. Um, and how it really grounds, you know, theories of race and queerness and politics in such a tangible way. Um, and it like particularly had me like as I was reading it, um, it had me thinking about my own mother a lot, um, who is also you know, brown and an immigrant and also a teacher. And her first language is in English. And the language and format of a lot of academic writing that kind of approaches theory and politics isn't accessible to her often. Um, so I found myself really excited as I was reading this book to share it with her. Um, and yeah, I'm just kind of wondering if you could speak to your own experience in writing in this way that departs from academic conventions in both form and subject and the potentials of that. Well, first, thanks for for um, linking me to your mom, which is an honor, and I wish I could 
high fiver in space, <laughs> brown, brown, brown mums doing things a little differently. Um, yeah, I think the, you know, I, I was, I was trained as an academic. I was raised as an academic when I was your age, I was kind of split between wanting to be a creative writer and, and wanting to be an academic. And I, um, uh, I chose the academic route because I was in creative writing classes as an undergrad and I, um, would always get really like judgy and pissy with my <laughs> peers about whatever it was that they were writing. And I decided I didn't want to be their teacher one day, um, which is dumb because now all I want to do is be their teacher. But, um, but I, but I took in part the academic route because I had immigrant parents and my immigrant parents were like, no way in hell. <laughs> is that creative writing route like they were they were pretty upset about me doing a phd in, in literature <laughs> much less you know thinking about me doing an mfa in poetry or something but um but yeah i think there were a lot of factors that that went into me choosing an academic route but a lot of my and i i do think theory is really interesting because you said you know my it's not accessible to my mom but i i think it's not accessible to a lot of people because it is a kind of language in and of itself that you have to train in and you have to learn as you as you kind of do a second language it's filled with terms and ideas and styles and forms that are not intuitive to to the vast majority of us and so for me when i started studying theory and when i started learning theory i was really besotted by it precisely because i didn't understand it and i'm always attracted to things that i don't that, that draw me in in some way but that i don't i don't really understand i don't really get and my my training mostly in, in early graduate school was really toward reading all these dense theoretical texts that I didn't understand that I would go to class being like, oh my God, I'm not, I, everybody else is going to understand this and I'm not going to understand this, but being drawn to like a line or a phrase or something, something that I, some kernel <laughs> that I took that I, that I was drawn to and finding that every time I would bring to the table a piece of something that that captivated me, it would speak to everybody and we could have a conversation and that through all of those little pieces that speak to somebody, you get this kind of incredible picture of what's going on and how theory interacts with each of us and kind of shapes each of our imaginations or, or intellectual imaginations. And so I wanted to start by just saying, I think theory is not something intuitive theory, but it's also not something that's simply hard. It's a way of thinking and it's a way of being that you have to learn. Like I had to learn Hindi and like I had to learn French and like I had to learn, right? Like you, it's, it takes study and practice. And I did that study and practice and I got pretty good at it in my first book, which was a very theoretical academic book called Unthinking Mastery. And I think part of what I learned through the, the project of Unthinking Mastery was, was exactly these questions I think that Michelle's asking around institutions, like what is it, what does it mean to have been trained to uphold certain conventions of being a human, um, of being a body in a colonial world, of what it means to be a body in a colonial world, um, and also what it would mean to to undo those attachments and to undo those the kind of legacies of, of social and political training that has very much informed who and what we are. And so the writing in a different way, and I think I am a very theoretical writer, even when I'm writing, I think even I think the breaks is very theoretical, um, even though it's not theory, as you're saying, right. Um, but it but it picks up a lot of questions that are fundamental to theory that are central and, and, and important to theory. And I, I think that I, I've sort of lost a, a desire or an attraction to modeling myself as a certain kind of intellectual and really wanted to take that intellectual thinking and that theoretical, you know, way of thinking and wondering and questioning that I, that I learned well through school and then figuring out how to live it and figure out, figuring out how to articulate it in language that was more poetic um, than it was theoretical, that could bring us really on the ground um, and into the materiality and, and um, sociality of everyday life. Um, and so I think, I think that's how I came to the breaks. It, it was sort of a training through my first book and then my second book was, was really trying to, to start doing that. And I think the breaks is really where it lands in, okay, here's the most intimate relationship of my life and how does theory inform it and how does it inform theory? Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I was definitely thinking along the lines of yeah, your way of articulating theory in a way that's 
you know, very grounded in your own experience. Um, yeah, and I really like the idea of, um, of kernels, bringing kernels to, to class. Yeah, yeah. yeah. See, see how it works out for you and also let me know what your mom thinks of the book. <laughs> <laughs> Um, maybe I'll jump in and read a few questions from the chat. Um, the first one is from May, and it's, in this course, we have explored conversations and relationships as artistic method. I was wondering if you have found artistic method in parenting. If so, what ways have your relationship with your daughter influenced your pathways of thought and expression of ideas? Okay. Um, I started, I started trying to <laughs> read down. This is what happens when I go into the chat. It's like, I'm, I'm lost. I go into another space. Um, I'm going to read that question again. So, uh, if you've found artistic method in parenting, what ways have your relationship with your daughter influenced your pathways of thought and expression of ideas? Oh, it's a really good question. I, I think that, um, you know, I was a very queer and non-reproductively oriented person until I reproduced. <laughs> and so I was not a person who had any fantasies of, of being a parent and certainly had no fantasies of being a mother, um, nor any fantasies of the beautiful embodiment of pregnancy. I was very kind of anti all of that. And I think I write in the breaks about growing up in a household where um, my, my mom has pretty actively been discouraging reproduction for several decades now. Um, as we confront global climate change. And so it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't something that was supposed to be in the cards for me. And so it wasn't something that I anticipated as um, creation or creative potential, but then there you are <laughs> with, a, with a small human who's learning. And um, I think it's, you know, in, in many, there are a lot of ways I can answer this question. I think it's the most creative relationship of my life, hands down. Um, you know, at the level of my own body sustaining her body, which is always an act of creation. Um, I don't, I don't mean biologically, but I mean in the in the everyday life of of making sure my body guides her body in ways that are safe and sustaining. But to also think about the ways that a lot of a lot of artistic practices that were very much shut off to me um, as a as a certain kind of person born in a certain kind of place to certain kinds of people many decades ago that that I think that a, a lot of the creativity that she brings into my life is also a kind of interesting way of um, getting to perform in ways that I wasn't able to when I was a kid and being in an environment that's so different, you know, growing up in a queer collective environment and collaborative environment is so different from the environment that I grew up in that it affords a lot of different kinds of um, ideas and forms of expression and um, even at the level of protest or at, at the level of um, everyday making or crafting that I think the the experience of being with her and it's interesting now because she's very tweeny <laughs> at this moment um, so she's she's much younger in the book already than she she feels to me now but in that in that period in which she felt much younger to me and she was much younger it was really a, a space of like constant, making and constant exchange and that that's that was as intellectual as it was material and practical so i think it's you know it sounds like ridiculous to say i got to experience my youth again and i don't even mean that because it didn't bring me back into what it was like to be five but it but it was an experience of being an adult who got to engage in things that i that as a person who didn't desire to be a parent or didn't wasn't angled toward parenthood didn't really imagine for myself um and we still have you know decades i hope to go so we'll see <laughs> we'll see what happens next so i'll keep you posted on the on the creativity to come um may answered thank you so much julietta you answered my question and more thank you um and we have from sky um another classic fafs question what does it mean to you to be a generative figure in a space here labeled as feminist? Is the idea of feminism an intention, intentional aspect of your work? I'm wondering, particularly as an artist who believes in the transformative power of language, whether the complicated history of this term poses challenges for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think 
I, I carry the, the um, you know, in some ways I'm a feminist studies professor. So yes, let's undo, let's undo the term and let's think about its, its violent and, and exclusionary and colonialist histories, absolutely. Um, but I think it's another one of those moments where we live in language and understand that um, even if we have serious critiques of feminism, we're probably not not feminists, <laughs> double double negative. Um, meaning, I'm never going to say I'm not a feminist because of the violent history of feminism. Um, and so, I think like all terms that we're that we're living in and that we're abiding by, um, it's a it's a problematic term. And I'm not sure that I feel that I'm here as a feminist. Um, Chase and Michelle, am I here as a feminist? I guess it's the feminist <laughs> field school, so so maybe yes. Um, but I but I think it's a maybe it's less of a like I am a feminist and more a kind of horizon of um, thinking and inheritance and then uninheriting part of that inheritance um, that that becomes useful for me in thinking about being here. Um, should I ask the last question in the chat? Okay. Oh, there's more. Okay. Um, from Desiree, <laughs> I really appreciated how you wrote about your experience of physical illness and having to reorient yourself to your body, and then also in relation to your child. I'm wondering if you could expand a little bit on how navigating this might have impacted your writing. Mm. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it literally impacted my writing at the level of having to stop it. Um, so I had started this, I had started this letter to my daughter right after I released my last book, which is called No Archive Will Restore You. And I was um, in the week of the book release doing promotion for that book and starting actively to write this letter, um, which was just like something that I wanted to do. You know, I had, I, I felt that I had achieved certain professional <laughs> accomplishments and and wanted to step back and write something that um that was directly to her um that didn't have to have any consequences for my career or my profession or my upward mobility or my recognition and just to like take this craft and make it not about getting a promotion or getting social accolades but actually just like take what i do this goes back to the how parenting um, links to creativity question but to write something to and for her that was just to and for her um that was a that was like you know me doing the thing that i love towards the thing that i love <laughs> and and i think that there was there was um a real moment of interruption where I had started re I had started writing and I had started it, it on the first page of the book, which remained the first page of the book in the run up to Thanksgiving last year. By by the way, by coincidence, that horrible colonialist holiday, it is American Thanksgiving today. <laughs> um, so the, the beginning of the book is all about Thanksgiving in America and it's it's Thanksgiving in America right now. Um, so so you know, I think I I was writing toward her and then interrupted because I began to be very symptomatic again and um, had a, a, a very serious health crisis that that led to a, a an emergency surgery that stopped the the writing of the book and it probably stopped for like eight or nine months while I recovered and reoriented from a surgery um, and then and then picked up again and I think it's 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 important it's impossible to say how is the book different than it than it would have been had that interruption not happened. But I can say, and I think I say it like maybe too quickly in this book, but I had a really funny moment where I was really irritated by the fact that I had written a book um, prior that was very much an experimental body memoir. And I didn't want to write about the body anymore. I was really like, I've written enough about the body. Now I'm going to write this book about mothering. And it's like the stupidest split in the world because you can't really write a book about mothering without writing about bodies <laughs> um like as a as a mothering is a very embodied practice and so it was a moment of forcing me back into the body when i was really trying to run away from it as a as a writer and as a human who was probably trying to run from my own um 
like injured and 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 suffering body. Um, so I think in the end, it was an opportunity for me to really think about, you know, I, I couldn't, it was, I, I already had the name, the breaks in my head, and I was thinking about the breaks more through emotional breaks and emotional ruptures, and then had to really weave in the breaking body um, as a, as a, as an as a as a fact that was going to reorient our lives that would change the way that we act together physically. Um, I was a very uh, hands on. I still am a very hands on um, mom. And I remember after after I saw the doctor after my second surgery, my question, my first question was, when can I pick up my kid again? And he was like, you'll never pick up your kid again. And so there was something about those moments of realizing this is the this is a this is a kind of end. And and every kind of end is a kind of beginning. And so what kind of beginning is it if I understand that I can't do the things that I was doing before or be the kind of body that I was being before. And so really trying to think about that that notion of the breaks that felt so emotional to me that felt so so much about family legacy and family history and um relations and interrelations and broken relations and then having to kind of suture that or stitch that or knit that alongside of um the the breaking body thank you so much i love thinking with you as to how every end is its own form of beginning and i'm not going to turn this into a cheesy transition which gets us out of this class and into the next moment, but it's going to be close. Um, <laughs> I, I, uh, I want to recognize in the chat that we have a comment from Megan, who um, joins us from outside of the weekly rhythms of the field school to ask about the exchange and whether or not you recognize the breaks as a kind of conversation with your daughter or um, yeah or something else entirely, but yes. I will also, <laughs> yes, exactly. But I will also flag that we have about three minutes left in our session. So maybe we could um, incorporate that question or that idea into any closing remarks that you might want to offer us. No pressure to do so. Okay, the, the question of the conversation with my daughter, yes, totally. And I think, you know, if I if I if I look back at all those scenes, I think not only is it a conversation, but it's a it's a series of encounters in which the idea of pedagogy itself is flipped on its head, and it's not the it's not the 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 mother um, teaching their child so much as it is the child teaching their mother how to be otherwise. Um, and so I think it's a it's a it's a conversation or a series of conversations to me that are incredibly promising because they allow us, I think, to think about ourselves differently and to kind of un unloosen or unshackle ourselves from some of those strangleholds of inheritances that we all carry, um, whether that's at the level of, of our, our families and our family histories or our personal histories or our racialized histories or our histories of disability um, or, or the histories of colonialism. Um, I guess, Chase, you know, I was thinking about something that you and I were talking about, about the the ways in which the book has been received. And maybe this is a kind of way of, of thinking about closure, which is that um, some of the early reviews of the book that came out, I found very excruciating <laughs> because while they seem to be positive reviews and said positive things, their, their way, their reviewer's way um, of approaching the book which I should be explicit in saying was a white way, like it was a it was reviewers who are who are like white um, industry facing publishing facing readers were reading the book as um, like an like a personal narrative of a brown queer mother toward her daughter um, and sort of reading it as though um, the the book is an account of my personal journey through through queerness and mothering, et cetera, as though it's an autobiography that is just like a single singular kind of um, capture of a life. And it reminded me of the ways in which the, the, the kind of history of the epistolary form, the letter form, um, is, a, is a history in which often, as I write in the breaks, black fathers are writing to their black sons or black kin and when those books are written, they're seen as like revolutionary, highly political, 
critiques of systemic racism, um, takedowns of white supremacy. And when a brown woman writes a book like this, it's seen as an intimate personal journey. And so one of the things that I've been really thinking about is the, the way that a book like this gets received and gets reduced to something like a single feminist story, um, an idiosyncratic story about brown queer mothering, rather than a summons for another world and a call for another world. And I think that has something really important to say about a patriarchy and the ways that we're trained to read or thought to read. Um, and B, the kind of lack of discourse of, of brownness in this country gets kind of reaffirmed or reified by its reception as something singular or particular rather than as a kind of much more universal call for other kinds of world relations and other kinds of socialities. Um, so that's a kind of critical way to end, sorry. <laughs> It's a spectacular way to end. Thank you for helping us to think through new world making strategies here with the Feminist Art Field School. We're deeply grateful for your time and for your work and for your care. Please join me in thanking Julieta Field School. We'll see you next week for our final session. I hope you have an extraordinary weekend. You know where to find us if you need us. Have a great day. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.